for God woke us up this morning. He took us through a busy day. And he brought us thus far here. He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. And they're all in Christ Jesus. We give humble thanks and manifold graces to the beloved Richard and Dorothy Coffey. The great Sweetwater Church for their painstaking effort and tireless toil for this great lectureship. Commendations are in order and I'm just thankful for the invitation to pay some small part in this memorable occasion. We bring you greetings from the north side of Tampa, from the beautiful city called Tampa, where we've just got through raving and cultishly standing in the last week's Super Bowl gala, and our city will never be the same. We're thankful to the saints at Northside who snuck up on me tonight to make sure I was where I said I was going. Thankful to all of those who have come and, and those who are traveling and some new converts are with them too. And my wife is also with us tonight. And I want her to stand at this time. Amen. She put up with me for quite a long time. And if she's planning on leaving, I just want her to know I ain't going to be left. But I'm just thankful she has a strong constitution. I have a wife who has a beautiful, quiet spirit. And she tell you what she want to tell you, and she mean what she says, and she says what she means. And she's not well right now, but she's here anyhow. I'm going to have to have some major surgery in two weeks. I want you to pray for her. And I pray to God that God will bless us. I'm thankful to God for the invitation by my good friend, Brother Johnny Daniels. As he flowered me up, and I had to wonder who he was talking about, great gospel preacher. I'm reminded of the story of the family whose father had passed, and he was a derelict and a crook all his life. And after they had the eulogy, the preacher didn't know him well and began to flower him up and speak words of honesty and kindness. And the mother, who was solemn and in bereavement, suddenly perked up and nudged the son and said, Son, Go look in that casket and make sure your daddy's still there. I don't know who he's talking about, but, <laughs> but John and Daniel, my good friend, over the years. After looking at the program upon registration, I found out that not only do they fix ballots in North Florida, but they set up preachers also. Put me behind two firehouses of the faith it was an injustice you've already had your two main courses and I'm just going to give you an appetizer I've learned a long time ago that you can't chase a T-bone steak or a New York strip with chopped liver you can't run down a stealth bomber with a crop duster let alone two stealth bombers but I'm thankful to God that I'm here to my good friend Walter Hewlett, you did a marvelous job from the panhandle of Texas. <laughs> Amen. And also to my grounded and sound good friend, Brother Eddie Gilmore. Me and Brother Eddie Gilmore went to Southwestern together too. And Brother Eddie Gilmore used to be an athlete. He used to, we used to play football together. Eddie Harper was the quarterback. And Eddie Gilmore was the center. And he used to clear the line. <laughs> clear the line. He also used to throw the shot put. Man, he could sling it. He was a star athlete. All right. And uh, Eddie Gilmore loved the Lord. Yeah. And he's a sinner. <laughs> Turn to Ephesians. A copy of God's Reader's Digest. Turn to Ephesians, the fourth chapter. Now, if you looked in your program, you see that Brother Hewlett and I have the same text. The same scriptures. And I've learned a long time ago to follow orders. I look at some situations of adversity optimistically. 
When you're thrown the blade of adversity, either you grab it by the blade and get cut up or grab it by the handle and use it. And I pray to God we can use it tonight. I'm reminded of the missionary who went off into the country and there he went through the fields of Africa and he saw a seven foot bath. And he didn't know what to do. And he being a young athlete like Eddie used to be, he saw the nearest tree and he started backing up to it. But the nearest branch was nine feet in the air. And he said, you know, I haven't jumped nine feet in a long time. So he backed up and the bear ran up on him. And he jumped and he missed the limb. But he caught it on the way down. That's optimism. That's optimism. Church, we need to be optimists. We need to be optimists in God's house. We're going to back up a few verses to verse number 21. Verse number 21. And uh, since we have the same text, we want to get the whole context. The Bible reads, If so be that you have heard him, have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation. The old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore put away lying and speak every man the truth with his neighbor for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good. That he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Underscore verse number 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. And all malice be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. The great gatherer, Paul, the prominent preacher of the gospel, is headed toward Jerusalem. And while he was headed toward Jerusalem, he went by a city called Ephesus. And there he established the Lord's church there. He met with them on several occasions. He met with them to encourage them, to admonish them, to strengthen them, to keep the elders going in the right direction. But this letter is being pinned from a Roman prison. Before the Praetorian God, Paul, through the Spirit, pins this letter of encouragement because there was heresy and problems arising in the church. Brethren, when problems arise in the church, we need spiritual folk to help us with our differences. When problems arise in the church, we need godly, humble folk, meek in spirit to help us with our problems. We need godly attitudes to quench lofty altitudes. But I like Paul because Paul is like a spiritual umpire. He calls strikes, strikes, and he calls balls, balls, no matter how fierce the crowds. He does it because it's the honorable thing to do. He's like a good judge who sometimes gives the guilty a plea of lawlessness and sentences them to the maximum of the law because it's the honorable thing to do. He's like a good doctor. He makes sometimes those Diagnosis which are unfavorable, but he does it because it's the honorable thing to do. 
like a good detective. He digs up evidence on the crime. He brings it out. And sometimes it's unfavorable evidence, but he does it because it's the honorable thing to do. 